talking about Peru. Let me pull this up as well because I have seen this story as well. I want you to comment. I seen this as well. I want you to comment on this, Andrew. I want to get your thoughts. Uh, you have uh, people in Haiti. Uh, I've seen people in Cuba, and now you have people in Peru that wave Russian flags. I've seen this one: massive Russian flag in the middle of the Peru protest. We need support from China and Russia. And why do they need that support? Um, you had the the current Peruvian president Dina Boluarte, who gained power because of, of a coup that is definitely supported by the United States. I know you had some reporting on this, Andrew. I want to pass it to you. To Apparently, the United States is preparing to send a ton of military supplies to Peru. I want you to explain, because you know more about this than me. We were talking about it a little bit earlier. I want to pass it to you so you can explain. Sure, yeah. I just threw a couple of links in the, the private chat on the stream in case you okay, wanted to pull it up. Yeah. First one is... Uh, Oh, this is good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Still in December. So uh, Pedro Castillo was removed as president on December 7th, and Dina Boluarte took office right then. Um, this is the sixth president in the past seven years to be removed by the Peruvian Congress. Um, and actually, the Peruvian Constitution has been uh, changed 12 times in its history since the foundation of the Peruvian Republic, which is fairly unique in Latin America. And the the clause in the constitution that the congress has used to remove these presidents is i believe it's called like a in a case of moral vacancy the congress can remove the president uh, for like a moral deficiency i can don't remember the exact wording that's from a 1839 change to the peruvian constitution so from what i understand and this is a topic that i need to learn more about most of these constitutional changes have been to further the control of the right wing of the landed aristocracy in Peru. Uh, there have been other countries in Latin America, Mexico, Nicaragua, Cuba, who have all fought revolutions over land reform. And Peru is a country that is in desperate need of that as well, which is a part of why these protests are happening. But out of those six presidents, including Castillo, who have been removed, five of them are in prison and one of them committed suicide when the security forces reached his home. So it's a pretty wild situation. And you have um, um, like Dina Boluarte, essentially she's only in president now with a little bit of support from the U.S. and an alliance with the hard right wing because she was uh, Castillo's vice president. Um, and she had made a vow to vacate her, you know, resign her office if um, Pedro was overthrown this way. It's like a legal coup, basically. Um but she hasn't, and she has been sicking security forces on protesters. And that article that I sent shows like uh, just a couple of weeks after the coup and before uh, any of the protesters had been murdered. Yeah, this, one, the, this one here? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, the U.S. promised $8 million for anti-narco-trafficking in Peru. Um, I guarantee you all of that money has been put into bullets and tear gas that I the cops it. and the military have used to kill now over 60 protesters. Um, the, I think the official number a week or so ago was about 56 or 57 protesters have been murdered by the security forces. Very yeah. often. This is a few weeks ago, by the way, this, this one says 40, but this is, this article is three weeks old, by the way. Just, yeah. Just as a. Yeah. And so I, I think it's very important to talk about Peru for a number of reasons. Um, primarily as with most conflicts in the world involving military force and the preservation of capitalism, um, or, you know, serfdom or slavery, whichever it is, wherever you are, um, the United States is very often involved. And in this case, they've already sent $8 million worth of weaponry and other support for, you know, anti-drug trafficking. Um, when we, you know, people are probably aware how much the United States intelligence agencies themselves take part in drug trafficking. So it's fairly hollow. Um, there's also the the second clip from uh, Twitter there, the Kausachin News one, is of, um, what's her name? Laura Richardson, I think. She's the commander let's, of... Let's, let's play real quick. Let's play yeah. and then you can comment on it if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's do it that way because yeah. uh, I think I've seen this and I want audiences to see it. And then let's play and, I'll and then we can comment on it. Uh, let's take a look at it. If I talk to uh, my number two um, adversary in the region, Russia, I mean, I've got... Uh, of course, the countries, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua with uh, Russia relationships. But what I really look at, and, and six other countries, by the way, so a total of nine that have Russian equipment, 
uh, in them, and uh, we're working to replace that Russian equipment uh, with United States equipment if those countries want to donate it to Ukraine or uh, the cause that's happening and be able to replace that with, uh, with U.S. equipment. And that's important because even this headline, you see how they they present this headline where it said to fight to anti drugs fight. <laughs> no, they they're gonna use this to, to kill protesters, right? But anyway, I, uh, I I want you to react to that, Andrew. And then we, Carlos, we get you in here if you have any takes on this. But go ahead, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I I actually I I kind of made a mistake. I meant to send another one from that same conference. I believe that was her addressing the Atlantic Council, which is a very close organ of NATO. There was another video from that same, you know, probably from the same segment of 10 or 15 minutes where she was saying that, why are we so interested? You know, why is there Southcom? Why would the U.S. invest resources in South America? And she just goes on to list all of the natural resources that they want to take over. And Laura Richardson herself, as well as uh, Lisa Kenna, who's a CIA officer who happens to currently be the ambassador from the United States to Peru. They've been talking with the, the far right um you know, forces in Congress in Peru in the weeks leading up to the coup. Afterwards, they negotiated this $8 million of anti-narco-trafficking, so-called, um, you know, anti-narco-trafficking aid. They've also been negotiating mining contracts with the new government. And this is just classic U.S. behavior after a coup. Um, I don't know if you all remember the coup in Guinea in West Africa in 2020, where immediately after the coup, of where the military officers had been trained by the United States. They overthrew the government in Guinea and they immediately canceled mining contracts with any Chinese companies and started to turn those back over to the West. And yeah, so that's that what it's about. That's what it's always about. Yeah. Go ahead. That's a major component. And I'll try and keep it quick because I know I'll just keep going and going. But the protests have not stopped in Peru. They have been led by uh, indigenous and peasant farmers um, in people working in the completely informal economy, so very precarious people, spending weeks and weeks and months now marching from the distant regions, the mountainous, more remote regions of Peru to Lima to demand several things. And among the de primary demands are dissolve the Congress, new elections immediately for president so that even if the Congress is not dissolved, they won't be able to just control things, which is what they've been doing for several years now. And also they want constituent assemblies for a new constitution. And I think it's so important for a number of reasons because it is a test of U.S. hegemony in Latin America. We saw the coup in 2019 in Bolivia, which was deadly and tragic and just sad to see that that's still how, you know, we haven't gotten any people's control of the United States government. And so that's still how our government is interacting with the rest of the world is just completely by coercion and violence. Uh, but that coup didn't last and Bolivia recovered. But Bolivia has numerous more years of building a cohesive, multi-ethnic nation. And so they're they're more stable. And so what I'm really interested in is the government in Peru has been making pretty terrible mistakes. They've broken their own laws. I don't know if I saw CJ actually covered on his show the other day, the video of the military Bar, like basically bombarding the gate of this university where they're always all of these protesters and students were at the university peacefully assembled and they mass arrested them and used chemical weapons and torture classic um you know capitalist police forces and this has just further enraged the society and past there have been past protests in peru that never really made it to that level of having the potential to build a similar durable and positive project like in bolivia they, the, before they kind of lost their steam, but there's more sectors slightly higher up in the economic ladder of Peruvian society that have come together um, with multiple unions, the campesinos and the indigenous people as well. And to me, that provides a lot of hope. So I won't say that I know that I'm very certain which way this conflict is going to go. I have a lot of hope and admiration for the people in Peru uh, pushing back against U.S. imperialism um, and against their local capitalist oligarchic class. Um, but I think that if it does go the way that Bolivia went, where it swings back the other way, to me, that's going to be a very positive sign in Latin America and a sign that this multipolar age is going to be more durable than in the 1970s, which is kind of the last time that we thought maybe the U.S. empire is not so strong as it was before. And I think this will be a test of that. Yeah, amazing breakdown, Andrew. Carlos, I'm going to get you in here if you have any thoughts. on. I don't know how much you've been following Peru. But anything you want to add to this discussion before we wrap up? 
No, I just want to say that this is yet another chapter in a long-standing history of U.S. intervention in Latin America and South America, and it's always had to do with natural resources. It's always had to do with the fact that they don't want a different type like the famous uh, in the murder, like a democratically elected communist or leftist uh, president or person of influence in any of those nations. We saw that right now happening again with Brazil because it sets an example that even in, within this hemisphere, right next to the United States, there's a possibility to have a leftist revolution like the one that happened in Mexico from 1910 to 1920, the Zapatista revolution, which was a peasant land reform based revolution and that's what the united states does not want to happen yet again and it keeps happening throughout uh, south america because people are th their lives are dependent on these natural resources and this is exactly what the united states is after so when you see peasants rising and risking their lives it's because at the end of the day they have nothing left to lose and as andrew very intelligently stated when those forces when that when that working class if to to use the u.s to use the, the 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 language we have here in the united states because we really don't talk about peasants we really don't talk about uh campesinos in the united states we just have you know farms and those have been taken over by the big industrial farming complex so at the end of the day we don't have an equivalent outside of the service industry outside of working class people identifying uh uh, with people like Campesinos and, and Health America. Why? Because they're at the end of the day, they're cutting off your access to your own livelihood to reproduce yourself on a daily basis, basically to live. And that's what's happening in places like Africa and Latin America, South America. And this is why BRICS is such a threat to the U.S. imperial uh, geopolitical domination. And Andrew is right. If this does turn around in Latin America, South America, hold firmly as leftist oriented uh, in, in, in this new uh, millennia, then the United States and Europe are going to realize that their, uh, their domination over the world, especially the global south, uh, is no longer as strong as it used to be or no longer exists. And you're going to have China, you're going to have nations like Russia uh, providing aid and assistance that is no longer connected to specific bank accounts or to certain interest rates, it might be more humanitarian than that. And that is the example that the United States does not want set in its own backyard.